The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, folks. Welcome. We're uh, kicking off with our first discussion tonight for the uh, MOC4 Agile Project Management. We're going to have a few housekeeping things to uh, discuss and cover before we kick off. Uh, my name is Brenton Birchmore. I've got a couple of other people to introduce to you tonight uh, before we kick off. We'll have a little bit of a housekeeping discussion. Uh, and we've also got some guest speakers on tonight that will be chatting to us about some of the specific things that we're going to cover. Uh, now, welcome everyone. Uh, there's a, a lot of people logged in tonight. Great to see you all here. Uh, fantastic to have uh, so many people involved in this course. We hope we can keep it interesting and alive and exciting for you as we go. Uh, just first of all, the agenda. What do we plan to cover tonight? We've got 90 minutes ahead of us, roughly, give or take. Uh, we will be having a bit of a chat about housekeeping in a moment, uh, as I said. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Master's uh, Program Overview with Charles Sturt. We have someone from Charles Sturt uh, on tonight who's going to be able to fill us in on some of the details for that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this particular uh, MOOC and what it will cover uh, and the topics that we'll be looking at over the next few weeks, just to give you an overview. And then we'll be talking about just a few things regarding Topic 1. Uh, now, first of all, what is a, a MOOC? Well, massive open online course. There's literally uh, thousands of people involved. Uh, we have uh, typically hundreds of people attending live webinars. We have content that's solid, real, uh, university level, but not just university level. It's master's level content. So hopefully this is intended to stretch your understanding of not just the surface of Agile, but also what lies underneath and the principles behind it. Now, a couple of important people uh, to let you know about tonight. Uh, I'm your subject mentor, so I'm the person uh, responsible for delivering all this thing, all of this to you. Uh, we have uh, Kelsey Van Haster, who is uh, joining us, or he's, he, she's with us now, but she'll be tuning in a little bit later to give you a bit more of the practical side of uh, some of the things. Uh, Kelsey works in the trenches, so to speak, uh, on making Agile a reality. So she'll be able to share with us some of her wealth of practical experience, uh, as well as theoretical knowledge. We have uh, James Hale and uh, Alex Ma who will be handling a lot of the text questions uh, that you'll be putting through in the questions box. So they'll be furiously responding to whatever they can and uh, at various points hopefully they'll be able to bring some of the questions out in the open uh, that we'll be able to chat about and address as we go through our webinar discussion tonight. Now, I have to apologise in advance that we might not be able to answer all the questions uh, that we put through as we obviously have a lot of people and a lot of interesting things to cover. Uh, if we don't answer any of the questions that you do have, etc., we will obviously have the opportunity to go over them in more detail via the forums, uh, which we'll be able to, to chat about more when we go through some of the housekeeping things. Uh, so firstly, the questions box is in the panel that you'll find on the uh, Citrix GoToWebinar on the right-hand side. Questions box there is where you would want to enter anything that you want to ask, comment, uh, suggest, etc. It's it's also a place where uh, you'll be able to see all the answers that have come back uh, from James and Alex that are uh, questions that other people have asked. Uh, so feel free to keep a good close eye on that. Uh, you won't need a microphone, so there's no need for uh, using voice for any of this. Uh, unfortunately, we do have too many people to turn that feature on, uh, so we will be relying on the questions box for dialogue between us. Uh, there is uh, also admin questions, back-end uh, questions, things about how this is all going to work. Uh, Alex and James will be able to answer all those sorts of things as well. I did mention the forums. Uh, the online course portal, you would have all received an email uh, at some point recently with some login details to get into learn.itmasters.edu.au. That is the place to go to find out what to expect, how this works, uh, what's supposed to happen. It's also the place where you'll find the forums that I talked about. Uh, so that's where the forums will have discussion points that will allow you to cover various things, questions about the content, questions about how things works. And of course, forums are there for everybody. So if you see questions in there that you've got an answer to or an opinion on, uh, feel free to chime in to those discussions. And uh, But do, do try to keep threads uh, within themselves and uh, check to see if there's a thread about your topic before you create a new one, just so we can keep the conversations sufficiently condensed. Now, these webinars are being recorded. So... This recording will be available uh, later on this evening. It will be uploaded into the portal that I just mentioned. Uh, so that will be the place to go to download it. Uh, you'll also find a link there to uh, where it will be uploaded on YouTube. So you'll be able to access it there. Uh, but uh, it will be in a few hours, but at least within 24. Now, we have uh, a couple of other things. Study guide, uh, a few things to think about in the study guide. That's up on the portal. Have a read of that. Uh, there are pre-recorded audio lectures up there. 
Uh, they're typically only around 20 minutes each. There's usually going to be three per topic. Normally, you'd be encouraged to listen to those prior to the webinar, but obviously this is a kickoff point tonight, so a lot of you may not have had a chance to listen to those yet, uh, but I'm sure you will over the coming days. And this is the web address, so this is the thing you'll know. You should have an email about that. Uh, if anyone just doesn't have or can't find their email uh, about this portal, uh, let us know. You can contact us at info at itmasters.edu.au and we'll be able to help you out with that. Now, Jason Howarth uh, is a course director at Charles Sturt University. Uh, Jason is going to be able to talk to us tonight about some of the things that are the background to this course and master's program. Jason, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Brenton. So welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm a course director at Charles Sturt, responsible for managing a, a suite of very industry-focused uh, courses that we have here at CSU, as we call ourselves. We've had a relationship with IT Masters, a partnership, for over a decade now, so it's a very strong association. And I just want to basically go through quite quickly the, the relevance of the short course tonight and how it actually slots into one of our master's programs that deal with project management. So the, the short course that you're undertaking now is in fact part of a subject that we run from CSU. Um, that subject is Agile Project Management and that is part of a, a number of our courses here, in particular the Master of Project Management and the Master of Management uh, in IT. Um, this is obviously a compressed version of, of, that, of that subject. Uh, typically a CSU subject will run over about three months. So you can see there the structure of the Master of Project Management. And look, I won't go through all of this. It is 12 subjects long. It does contain a very industry-focused material based on actual industry certifications from Agile and uh, PMP, as well as more academic-style subjects. Two of the main features I want to point out here is that you can get credit into this program on the basis of certain industry certifications. So if you have the, the PMP certification, you can be credited for up to two subjects prints to one subject, and if you have the Agile Certified Practitioner, another subject credit there. The other thing I want to point out is that um, you don't necessarily need to have an undergraduate degree to get into this program. We will accept people on the basis of extensive uh, work experience, a minimum of, of three years work experience uh, in a professional role. So if you are in doubt as to whether you'll uh, be eligible or not, uh, down the bottom there you'll see my contact details. And you can also go to the IT Masters site, that's www.itmasters.edu.au and actually fill out the eligibility form to find out how much credit you'll be eligible for and whether you're eligible for the program. So please take advantage of that. Uh, now I just want to move to the next slide now and we can look at uh, CSU in terms of market leadership. So this is a distance education program, which means that it's all online. It's meant to be done online and part-time. You can do our master's programs in around about two years, uh, studying part-time. And you can see there when we line up against the other universities in, in terms of postgraduate uh, IT in particular, um, and in terms of distance education, we're well ahead of the pack. Okay, so um, well ahead of the nearest competitor, which is Southern Queensland. So we do do distance education very well, and it's a very online interactive experience. Webinars like this one, for example, are a key feature of many subjects, where each week you log in and actually participate in, in an online interactive lecture. And finally, in terms of, in terms of information technology, uh, postgraduate, which is master's level in the domestic market, you can see as well that we're well ahead of other competitors in the area. So we are doing something right in this space. So look, I won't take any more of your time. Uh, please get in touch if you have any questions about the program. Uh, and look, please enjoy the short course. I know Breton will deliver a great, a great program. So thank you, Breton. Thanks very much um, for that, Jason. Great for that input uh, and info. So the summary here is that what you're about to go through over the next four weeks is an excerpt from a master's level program. Uh, the content and the topics that we're going to be covering is at that level, it's from that. Uh, so if you do join in and get involved in that at a larger scale, some of this when you come across it might seem a tad familiar. Now, just before we go into the course outline, uh, let me give you a bit of an introduction about myself. My uh, background has been mostly corporate. Uh, I've done quite a bit with uh, various kinds of projects over the years, but I have a company, I'm actually based in Singapore. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm broadcasting this from sunny Singapore, somewhere close to the equator, uh, where it's possibly a slightly different weather pattern than what you're experiencing right now. Uh, it, it usually is. But uh, from here, I run a business that 
deals with user experience design and sits neatly in the middle between clients and digital media of any kind. So the meat and the sandwich, so to speak. So a lot of my background the last sort of 10 years has been involved in sorting out the mess that goes on in between people that want something to appear on a screen, typically software or some other form of digital media, and the people that need to actually produce that. And it really is often a case of being at the meat and the sandwich. And so the development of Agile that has arisen uh, over the last decade has been very interesting in how it's changed and reshaped a lot of the relationships. What we're going to cover over the next few weeks is these four points. And here's a quick overview uh, of what we mean by these things. Some of you might have already seen this list. What it essentially means is tonight we're going to cover the definition. We're going to try and talk about a few things that look at it from a high level. What is the foundation of Agile? Where does it come from? Uh, what is and what isn't Agile uh, and the relevance of it? And next week we're going to talk about some of the core principles. So we are going to have a look at the Agile Manifesto. Uh, we'll talk about some of these core principles that are listed here, value over constraints. It's, it's the, the primary over the, the secondary and what's important in the Agile paradigm. Week three, we're going to have a bit of a chat about the, the Agile model. Uh, we're going to look at enterprise framework and delivery framework. That's going to start to get a little bit practical. We're going to talk a little bit about how things get done. And in week four, it's going to be the most practical. Here we're going to talk about some of the actual tools themselves, some of the features, uh, some of the components of the toolbox that we put into Agile. And uh, we'll touch on a little bit about some of the specific sub-methods, uh, but uh, more of those you'll find in the full subject uh, of Agile, which is a, a 10 topic subject. So we're going to be doing four of those 10 topics over the next few weeks. Now, for some of you who have had a chance to listen to the pre-recorded audio, uh, some of these things that we're going to talk about in a moment uh, will ring a few bells and uh, some of them might seem a little bit different. I want to talk about the mindset, the high level mindset of what goes on with people when they encounter the idea of what is Agile. So what is a planist and what's a reactivist? Well, what's a planist? A planist is someone who wants to have a plan before they take a step in any direction. And yes, I made that word up. Uh, planist is not really a valid word. Same with reactivists, by the way. Um, we made both of those words up so that we all sort of feel equally offended by them. But are we a planist or reactivist? Obviously, we're talking about stereotypes. We're talking about the difference between two attitudes and two approaches. But typically, when we get the starting point of how do we embrace Agile and how do we go about dealing with Agile in an existing environment, the easiest way is to begin with looking at these stereotypes and finding where people fit on the scale between being a planist or being a bit of a reactivist. So reactivists are different people who don't care to spend a lot of time on planning. And these are the sort of people that prefer to work it out when they get there. Uh, these are the people that tend to want to figure it out as it arrives. And it is a totally different mindset. And there are core reasons why people have these particular mindsets and these particular ways of going about things. And it's these reasons that are relevant to us when we are making key decisions about to agile or not to agile. And if we do want to agile, how do we do it? How do we get our team involved with it? How do we make it work? So planists are people that planning is about maximizing calm during a creation process in order to promote productivity in the moment. So by thinking about it ahead of time, by making a plan, and let's take a simplified example such as the shopping list. We write a shopping list so that we're not stressed and worried in the supermarket aisle as to what do we need. Now, some people write a shopping list and then don't follow it. Uh, I know I've been guilty of that more than once. But when we look at planning ahead of time, there are elements of each of us that have a certain satisfaction from knowing in advance where things are happening. So planning is a, a compromise of the journey in the interests of progress. So we say, okay, well, we might not buy something because we didn't put it on our shopping list. But we're prepared to compromise that because we'll get through our shopping quicker. So the journey can be sometimes a little bit more rigid in the interests of getting to the end of it. But we measure against the plan more than we measure against the objectives themselves. So when we're looking for success criteria, and usually a person with a sort of planist mindset that's going to go and put everything down in advance is going to feel pretty good about the fact that they've ticked everything off on their shopping list as opposed to someone who doesn't really want a shopping list but feels pretty good when they come out of it thinking I've got everything I need. 
And it's where those positive feelings come from that makes a difference as to how we go about our approach to all of this. So we want planning because it reduces stress. It reduces expectations, uh, it manages those expectations, and it reduces the, the surprise and potential chaos that can come out of situations. And most of us have an inherent desire to minimise chaos and surprise. Nice surprises are nice, they, they can be okay. But for the most part, when we're looking for the end game, when we're looking for completion and success, we generally shy away from surprises because they're normally bad news. So what we try and do a lot of the time in this mindset is we like to create a series of dots and we like to join the dots primarily to avoid stress. So when you're talking about people with a mindset that are planists in nature and you're talking about scattering their dots across the floor, what we need to remember is that we are immediately dealing with a stress-related issue. This isn't just a process and methodology of how we run a project. This is a process of how do we manage our stress just as much. One of the things about plans is that plans are representatives. They represent the goals that we've locked in. They represent what we're trying to achieve. And as representatives, they are inherently imperfect. No representative is going to 100% represent something else. And this is the challenge that we have with the advanced plan methodology. Now, three words here I want to think about. Acuity, alacrity, celerity. Essentially what we're saying is that we need to do things fairly quickly in the modern era. We need to be fast about it, we need to be rapid, we need to be efficient, we need to be smart. This is something we hear quite a lot when we say, no, no, we've got to do this smarter. We have to do this in a more clever way. When we have planists' methodology, we are dealing with a level of emotional discomfort in rearranging things. So this is, comes out of our relationship between specificity versus approximacy. How much, how specific does something need to be? The more specific it needs to be, the more of a plan we need. If we're going to build a bridge across a river, there's some fairly specific things that need to have happen, like making sure it doesn't fall down. When we come, with, come, come along to other things such as software, specificity is less important. So these three words are intellectual markers of thought. Another way of looking at these three words, acuity, alacrity, serity, they also mean focus. Alacrity refers to a level of energy, and celerity is the speed. So focus, energy, and speed. These three have another set of parallels, which are intent, investment, and application. What we want to achieve, why we want it, and what we are doing about it. So the starting point when we're thinking about Agile is, what kind of person are we? What, what stresses us? What stresses you? What stresses the people that we're dealing with? How much of that is based on not knowing enough in advance? And how much of it is based on being stuck with what was figured out beforehand? So if we need to plan a lot before we begin, we might be leaning towards the planner's camp. If we are someone who is preferring the lack of planning and need to consider us more of a reactivist, but if we fall somewhere in between, if we want to be able to leverage planning only for what we need and adapt that plan as we need to, then maybe we can call ourselves something a little more sexy. Maybe we can call ourselves an agilist, another made up word. Now, being agile requires a little bit of bravery. It requires a little bit of courage because what we're saying is that we are prepared to take the risk that some of the things that we probably would have otherwise liked to know up front, we either have to say, well, we're not going to, we can't for various reasons, or we've accepted that it's best not to, because we'll have a better version of those facts a little bit later. So the bravery comes from the fact that we need to be prepared to make an investment and move forward without necessarily having everything that we could have lined up up front. So the phrase, some of the phrase you might have heard, fortune favours the audacious. It's actually been used a little more regularly as fortune favours the brave. It was a original saying, fortune favours the audacious, is something that uh, was invented by a Dutch priest uh, somewhere around about the 1500. Uh, Erasmus was uh, 
a humanist and a, and a very clever guy. And if you ever got five minutes up your sleeve to Google uh, Erasmus, you'll find quite a few other interesting quotes that we still use in, in common word today. But what the message of this is that if we are starting from a planist point of view, we need to find a little bit of bravery in order to tackle a slightly different direction. Now, fortune in this context, we're talking about the uncertainty. We're talking about the possibility that there'll be threats that we'll need to react to and opportunities that we'll want to take advantage of. This is where fortune can be good for us and bad for us, and it will usually be a bit of both along the way. And how we respond to that will determine, be determined a little bit by how brave we are. Now let's look at this question from the reactivist point of view. Let's shift the emphasis a little bit. So we talked about reactivists. Reactivists are those that see the they don't see the same value in a pre-planned decisions. So they value the ultimate flexibility and the power of the timely decision. These are people who often can't focus on the plan or sometimes just can't remember it. This is the people who say, well, plan? We've got a plan? Oh, I remember seeing something on a document somewhere, but I'm doing it this way. Now, the reason behind this mindset is that they believe that just in time is better than just in case. And that the excess effort spent on the maybe or the possible or the theoretical, they view as being poorly invested energy and perhaps even wasted. So this mindset says that after all, we have to consider if we have to consider every possibility, we could spend a, a lot more effort than just considering the actual. So their question is, well, is it worth it? Is it even helpful? So in, if any plan is only really as powerful as its impact, can be at the time that it's applied, then the further in advance we make our plans, the more difficult or the more disconnected it can be to the need to apply it when the time comes. So reactivist thinking doesn't, reactivists don't embrace the plan. They evolve their own version of that plan. And you'll know these people in the workplace because those, these will be the people that are already thinking in terms of what should be done rather than what the plan says they should be doing. They're the people that are typically trying to be two steps ahead of the plan and often chafing underneath it. These are the ones that are usually agitating for the changes to the plan. But what if we didn't have a plan at all? What if there was no plan and there was what we might think of as ultimate freedom? I want to talk a little bit about how this affects decisions because there's a flip side to both of these positions. Now the decisions that we make come from the foundations of three things, our understanding, our wisdom, and our context. That is our understanding of what's going on, our wisdom of how to apply that understanding, and the context within which we apply it and its relevance. So there are certain elements of this that we can't do with limited or minimal application of thought and effort. So decisions are made by a series of judgments that are linked to our perception of the facts. There are estimates and, and our estimates on the repercussions or consequences of things and our ability to contextually theorize. So in order to understand this a little bit, let's go back a little bit to the neuroscience that we touched on in the pre-recorded discussion. A decision requires us to rearrange our, our thinking or our, our synapses in our brain and requires us to do so rapidly and sometimes in new and unusual ways. So a decision means that we have to consider a wide range of concepts, often living in very different portions of our brain and our consciousness. And we have to electronically or electrically interact with those within our brain. It's challenging to do. We've got to consider all the various options and pull everything together, and we need to come up with a satisfactory conclusion. Now, according to neuroscience, how easy or how hard this is depends on how easy the brain finds those alternative thinking parts. For example, if I asked each of you to make a decision on which email software we should probably use, most of you would be able to arrive at a fairly quick decision because you've got a sense of familiarity, you've got an understanding with email systems, you have some exposure to it. Part of your consciousness has already been devoted to evaluating the pros and cons of email systems that you've encountered in the past. That kind of decision does not require your brain and your thought processes to go into any bizarre and unusual places. 
Now, what if I asked you to decide whether we should hold a global conference on Agile in London or in Hong Kong? Generally, most of you would take a little longer to be satisfied with your answer because you'd have a lower level of context and a lesser accumulated analysis of how to contribute to that decision. So it sounds like a fairly extreme example, but it can be brought down to even decisions that sound very much similar in scale and challenge. There's always going to be a discrepancy between how much mental effort we have to apply in order to make a decision. So in short, the decisions, they're easier and they're more sound when they're based on things we've already given some thought to. When we extrapolate this into an entire team, it becomes magnified. So this is not necessarily plans. It's not even planning. It's preparedness. So you think about having a discussion with someone, an important meeting. And before that meeting, you think in your mind about what you might say, what they might say, what you might say in response to that. And some facts that they might throw up that well, you probably should look that up because you need to be at least appearing as you know all about that. And this is where we mentally rehearse and prepare ourselves. When we're talking about agile, we're talking about decisions, we're talking about very much the same sort of thing. A degree of preparedness empowers our ability to make these decisions and make them well. Dwight Eisenhower once was quoted as saying, plans are useless, but planning is everything. I think the words he might have used were planning is indispensable. The point there is that the actual plan, as ultimately documented, is always imperfect. But the planning, the degree of investment that went into thinking about, contemplating, and sharing an aligned understanding between members of a team is invaluable because it drastically shortens the gap between our starting point and our good decision as and when the decisions need to be made. And we've already talked about in the pre-recorded audio that Agile is about rearranging the decision and shortening the time frame for that decision making because we're going to be relying upon more timely information at the particular point in the sequence that we need it. So we really do benefit from having a certain degree of preparedness in our decision making. So agility is responsiveness. It's our ability to step quickly and surely and in the right direction. It's about timely decisions, decisions that are based on planning and preparation, but they're not based on ignorance and hope. Now, another famous gentleman by the name of Louis Pasteur, a scientific chap uh, who was around in the late 1800s, early 1900s, he lent his name to a, a process that some of you might be familiar with, which is the pasteurization of milk. Um, but, you know, generally another clever chap. He put forward a quote that some of us have already encountered. Fortune favours the prepared mind. Now, what this essentially means is that the more we've been able to broadly contemplate the possibilities, the more we'll be able to react responsibly to those possibilities, be they good or bad. So if we've already accepted under this context from planet's point of view that we need to think that fortune favours the brave, and we also think that as a reactivist we need to remember that fortune favours the prepared mind, somewhere in the middle is what we're aiming for. Somewhere in the middle is where we need to bring our stereotypes into balance. Hi, Brenton. I might just jump in here and um, let you know of a couple of questions that have come up, if you'd like. Certainly, James. Please do. Uh, one that's come up a few times is about the PMI PDUs uh, and whether or not uh, people can get PDUs for attending this short course. Yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of questions about this on the discussion forums as well. The, the thinking, I've spoken to a few people who are definitely planning on claiming these uh, PDUs with PMI. PMI has some guidelines on their website that talk about how you can claim PDUs and third party uh, education programs are definitely part of it. Uh, there is a formula that they apply. We don't have any official endorsement or arrangement yet with this. I mean, it's hard to do when you haven't yet fully delivered it. But it's something that I suspect that a lot of people who are uh, PMI professionals will be planning to 
use that process to claim their time spent under this as their personal element. So uh, I know people who will, I would encourage you to do, but it is up to PMI to determine uh, how and what they actually approve. There's, there's no official rubber stamp that's uh, been done in advance. Yep. Oh, and actually, one question that's just come through, a very good question, is what are PDUs? Uh, <laughs> PDUs are essentially a way of the Project Management Institute from ensuring that their qualified professionals stay up to date. So PDUs are essentially a professional development. It's about demonstrating to the Institute that you are keeping up to date and you are giving back to, not only to yourself, but the industry. So. Uh, PDUs are a way for you to show them that you're continuing to improve and keep yourself up to date uh, within your uh, profession of project management. Great. That sounds like a, um, a good initiative and, a, and something that I'd like to see students on this course applying for. Uh, like you said, there's yeah. some discussion on the forums already about it. Uh, if anyone does apply for it, I'd like to um, if you could post on the forum about your, your experience applying for the PDUs on this course, that, that'd be great. Um, yeah, let us know how it goes. Other people can apply the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Give us any tips. If you, uh, if you uh, claim and uh, get results, uh, let everyone else know on the forums so that'll help those who aren't too sure how to go about it. Uh, might get some tips and insight from all of that. Great. All right. Uh, uh, any other sorry, questions? Sorry, just one other question. Up? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, seemed like a pretty good question to me. Is is agile project management centered on IT only, or is it applicable in other areas? I think it's very applicable in a lot of other areas. And what we're finding, and uh, that we touched on some of this in some of the pre-recorded, the the philosophy of why the principle of making your decisions as and when you need to, as a concept, is generally being regarded as a good thing. It doesn't necessarily just have to apply to projects. And we're talking tonight about the mindset of people who want to plan in advance and, and want to make the decisions as they go. And there's a general trend and business pressure as well as social pressure towards just making your decisions as and when you need to with the best information available. So if we sort of put, put a stake in the ground and say, well, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. We like that, but we want to make it work for us. It can apply to a wide variety of things outside of technology. Obviously, it began its life as a set of principles for software development, and for good reason, because up until then, the traditional methods of dealing with projects and project management really did struggle to do a good job for highly empirical projects. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that's the case uh, in the slide after this one. About what is it behind projects that make uh, the existing system so difficult, and why Agile has, has found a bit of pressure. But when you look at these sorts of empirical projects, it doesn't have to be technology. Uh, it can be anything that's innately in, empirical in nature. So it's a good question and it's a good point and I think over the next sort of 10, 15 minutes we'll even be able to elaborate further uh, and answer that question in even more detail. Uh, James, was there any other good questions that we, uh, we can jump in and grab now or uh, should we carry on? Uh, there's a bunch coming through and there's, there's probably, sorry everyone, we're, we're not going to be able to answer every question on the spot now. Um, we'll, we've given you the, the link learn.itmasters.edu.au um, so definitely if you can't get your uh, question answered tonight, jump on the forum and ask it and we'll have, all have a discussion about it. There's just one more that's been asked a few times is will we get a certificate for this course? Uh, there is an exam at the end of the, on the last week of the course, it runs for one week, you can sit at any time in that week and if you get more than 50% on that exam we will give you a certificate of achievement. So yes, they will, they will get, uh, it's, a, it's a digital certificate isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, it'll, it'll be an image with a, yeah. So you'll have to print it out before you stick it on the wall but I guess we're all used to that so. Uh, there certainly will be a, an, an official acknowledgement uh, that, uh, that you've achieved in regards to this short course. So, um, so yes, there will be that. Uh, so, uh, it's, I mean, there's certainly a lot of value in, in knowing and, and uh, being able to demonstrate that you've ticked these boxes and done these things. So, absolutely, uh, there, there'll be official recognition of that. But you do actually have to uh, attend the online uh, test at the end and pass it, correct, James? Uh, we don't have a thanks for coming certificate. It's only if you pass. That's right. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So that'll that uh, we'll talk more about that test as we get towards it, but that'll be in week five. Um, so you'll have plenty of time to have uh, listened and absorbed and uh, re-listened to all the stuff that we're covering over the next few weeks. All right. Thanks for that, James. If you get any more other good questions? Uh, yeah, jump in. Let us know. We'll we'll tackle them as we go uh, bit by bit. So. Okay, we talked about different mindsets and uh, we've called them stereotypes because they really are and obviously no one's going to fit into any one particular category, everyone's going to be some bracket in between, but these are the opposing forces at work here. Uh, so when we're tackling the challenges of an agile approach, whether to be agile or whether not to be and how should we be, we first got to be trying to be clear on what that approach is based on, how does it work uh, and how is it different from what people assume that it is. So some of the biggest obstacles in embracing agile thinking, which, uh, which Kelsey's going to talk about in a little while, they come from these assumptions. We know that assumptions are the gap fillers of knowledge. Uh, essentially, they're the putty uh, that we put in the hole to cover up the ignorance. And it's a natural and subconscious event. We don't like to feel ignorant. And we very often trick ourselves into using the sub uh, an assumption as a substitute for finding out. So taking this another step, if assumption is sort of like a substitute for knowledge, and then obviously education is our best tool for salvation. So those of you who are at the beginning of Agile, looking into Agile, about to go Agile, etc., this is the sort of uh, kind of education, the kind of course, the kind of material that people who are not sure should get exposed to and should be looking for and trying to find out. Dispel the myths, clarify the vague, and establish the framework uh, as a useful starting point. I mean, these concepts are often still hotly debated, uh, they're still evolving, uh, there's still a lot of assumptive concept that any Agile project should or shouldn't uh, proceed, and what sort of effort uh, is required, and what does it mean to understand Agile. So these stereotypes may be quite simplified, but we need to have the right message that appeals to, but also stretches the mindset of those involved, depending on the foundation of their starting point. So, to the planists, we probably tend to say that the good decisions that we want to make, they're going to have to be based on information that is up to date, and we don't yet have that. There is stuff we're going to have to decide when it happens. We will make planned decisions, but just not as far ahead as you might have liked. We can tell them that our plan uh, is, might be undermined by the vagaries of the goal and, and its creators, the, the, the customers. And that we will do the planning. We'll just do it as and when we can as we move forward. And to the reactivists, our message is we need to be more prepared. We need to be aligned. We need to all be thinking about it in a similar enough context so that when we are making our decisions that we have to make in advance, we're going to be making them with a sufficient degree of preparation to make good collective empowered decisions that we have to contribute to together along the way. And yeah, there might be some flexibility in how we get there. You know, the journey is going to be a little bit different and there's some things we're going to have to figure out as we go, but there are certain elements that we really do need to define up front and as and when they evolve and change. We need to make sure they evolve in a clearly understood, clearly shared and clearly aligned framework. What we can't afford is to have Agile being this half of the team goes in this direction and this half of the team goes in the other direction. But the bottom line that applies to the same is that it's the same important decisions, we're just making them in a slightly different order. So if it's about making the right decision, Agile is not really about less planning. It's about hot planning instead of cold planning. And this is why we talk about planning instead of talking about a plan. A plan goes cold. And the colder it gets, the more yuck it tastes. And the more we have to keep remaking it and reheating it. But hot planning tastes good, it's always fresh, and it's often just what we need. So where does all this come from? What's the origin of all this interest and discussion about is Agile good, how good is it, what's it going to do for me, etc.? Empirical projects, the definition here is that empirical, proje empirical projects are those that have to learn along the way. These are projects that you just can't know in advance everything about it. It's quite different from things that you can completely conceptualize in advance. 
such as a building. Uh, I mean, quantity surveyors will tell you that you know they know exactly how many rivets go into a multi-story building. Give or take a very small percentage. But building a piece of software, we don't know how many rivets is going to go into that because often we don't know exactly what it's going to be at the end of it. So here is a short list of top 10 challenges and reasons for empir empirical based projects that mean we need something better than figuring it out all in advance. So off the top, sometimes the client just doesn't know what they want. You know, sometimes the words needs analysis, are they kind of like big words for people that the client didn't bother to look them up in the dictionary, they don't know what it means, they didn't dig, they didn't find out. So we know this story, we've, we've seen and we've encountered this. The client asked for something that they dreamed up with just as much clarity as any dream. Uh, but better still, those that are actually empowered to spend the money, but who didn't pay enough attention to those who are actually going to use what's getting built. This is the people, this is the clients that turn around and say, yeah, um, you know, we've got a team of 100 people that need this thing to do this thing, and well, I asked the two people that mattered, and, and so I know what they need. That's number two. The client thinks they know what they want, but are actually wrong. And point here is that they will discover at some point in the journey the nature of their mistake. Now, we often think in a lot of industries the customer is always right, but you know, anything can be right in the absence of a competing argument. The customer pays for the privilege to make things right by changing it later. And when we say pays, I mean they generally really pay. So the definition of what's right and, and what's needed and what's correct changes and evolves as the customer learns and as things change. So we get to point three. You know, the client says, well, we, we, we need to dig a hole, so we want something called a shovel. And we all look at each other blankly, what, what's a shovel? I've never heard of this shovel thing. Um, we've got no idea. Or, yes, we know what a shovel is. Well, it's, it's kind of long, it's made of wood, it's got this flat metal thing on the end and a handle on the other end. We can build that. So we think we understand what we need, but we might not be that correct. All of this we're talking about here is communication failures. Sure, we might think, oh yeah, we can fix all that just with some decent communication. This is where my company that I talked about before originated its, its starting point where this disparity of, of uncertainty was part of the problem and it remains the problem and it's always going to be the problem because we're going to have user people, people that are working in totally different industries unrelated to the creation of these projects who have an idea of what they want their lives to be and no idea of what it's actually going to take at the engine room level to create this and the people in the engine room level that just don't have anywhere near enough connection to what goes on in this obscure industry that they've never heard about in order to make exactly what's needed without a thorough dialogue or without the ability to evolve towards it. So you get to things like point 0.5. Okay, so we don't know how to do this. Now, we've all been in that situation where we've had to do something for the first time. And you could argue in some ways that every piece of software gets done for the first time because if you're not going to use it, if you're not going to build something now, well, you, probably because you would have bought something off the shelf if that was going to do the job. So when you're creating something like this, there's always an element of first time through. Something that's new, something that's different. So we also have to be a little bit gentle with ourselves and say, well, of course, we're not going to know everything in advance. We're not going to have everything ironed out and clearly understood. But sometimes we think we do, but we don't. Point six, we think we know how to do this, but we're not right. Somewhere along the way, we realize that we need to tackle this a little bit differently. Things are changing. But then, of course, we get to point seven. So external factors. Let's start with a really big one that happened in 2009, global financial crisis, GFC, three big letters that arrived like a big cloud of doom over the top of software projects around the world and says, you are doomed. And uh, those of you who were in software and or related sort of project, projects at the time would have seen a lot of concerned faces of the people that are worried about their software projects because you're in the space of something that is being empirically evolved, uncertainty in its very nature, and suddenly there's uncertainty surrounding the budget, things become trouble. But at a point eight, the client discovers that you can dig dirt really quickly with a water jet. 
Oh, we don't want a shovel anymore. We want a water jet. That's really cool. Can you make one of those? Well, we've already made, no, no, no. Can you make a water jet? Well, we might learn that actually, if you're trying to dig dirt with water, you get mud. Air blasting, that's the way to go. Let's dig with air. We know how to dig with air. Let's tell the client we can do a far better job than this water digging thing. And then, of course, point 10. Client comes along and says, you know, you were building us these little things that were going to run around and dig holes. So we now we need to dig a thousand holes. Can you do something that digs by itself? Let me wave this budget under your nose. Get started. These are all simplistic versions of what goes on and why we have these enormous challenges with trying to build something by planning it all in advance. No plan is going to survive this when you have something that in its very nature of creation is going to evolve in this path. How are we going with questions, James? Have we got any interesting questions about some of the stuff we've been talking about tonight? Is there anything that we want to throw in at this point? We do have a pretty good one. Um, if you're planning as you go, how do you budget? Okay. Is a, a good question. question. If you're going to say how long is a piece of string, then how am I going to pay for the piece of string if I don't know how long it is? It's a totally different set of priorities. And in fact, I, I might, um, I might raise that question for, for Kelsey to focus on in a little while because some of what she's going to cover shortly is going to help paint a better picture about the differences between what we think about it. Essentially, in a nutshell, it's about we're not saying that this is what we need to have now, what's it going to cost to build it? We're saying, well, this is how much money we've got. What can we build for that? Now, it's not always that simplistic, but it's that direction. It's that emphasis. It's saying we start with different fixed variables or, or fixed uh, details, and we have other things that are differently variable. So variables such as, well, what are we going to get for that? Uh, you could look at from, a, a, like for example, a bank that says, we don't care how much money it takes. We need the world's best financial management system. Okay, that's, that's good. They're a bank. They've probably got lots of money. Uh, compare that to some other small, medium organization that says, well, you know, we've got a budget of you know, $150,000 and we need a better customer records management system that, that's going to do that job. So they're not able to say, well, look, you know, we needed to do this, this, and this, and we know everything we're going to have to do, and so you tell us how much. We're no, we've got this much money. Let's talk about how many features and, and functionality and what we can get out of that kind of budget. So it's a very different emphasis and very different approach. But I suspect that we'll get a lot more info out of that when Kelsey has her chat in a little while, in, in about 10 minutes or so. Great. One other question is not on the content, but about the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a few different questions about how the exam is structured. Uh, I can I can sort of feel this. Uh, basically, is it an open book exam? Yes, it is. You can use whatever resources you can get your hands on it within the time limit. But the the time there is a set time limit from when you choose to sit it. So you can sit it any time in the week. But uh, I believe we've set it at an hour, or was it an hour and a half? Uh, I think that's not confirmed. It's, uh, we're, we're still working out exactly how the question structure is going to fit and how many questions in it. But it, it'll probably be closer to uh, uh, to an hour and a bit. And uh, you'll have a week in which to kick off that hour. But once you start that hour, the clock's ticking. And when it finishes, your test is finished. So obviously you want to make sure you've got your, your time free and ready to start that. Um, but the hard part about it being open book is that there's only so many time, so many minutes you've got, and it can often be difficult to rummage through various notes and, and audio and things like that to uh, recollect what a particular question or the answer to it might be. So it's still going to rely heavily on what you've learned, uh, but you'll be able to look up anything that that you can. If you're a whiz at looking things up and sourcing data and finding things, then that'll probably help. But it, it'll be reasonable. Just like the real world. Yeah, just exactly right. It'll be reasonably tight. I mean, you're not going to be sort of answering half a dozen questions and then have half an hour to spare to do your research. It'll be a lot tighter than that. Yeah. Uh, one more question is, can we take it again? In that one-week period, you can only try it once uh, for the sake of getting grades and giving certificates. Uh, but after that week is over, we'll open up the exam and, and you, for your own sake of, of learning and, and testing yourself, you can try it as many times as you'd like. Right, so the, the, only the first test counts for the certificate, is that right, James? But after that, you can do it as many times as you like for your own knowledge. Yeah. 
Excellent. All right. Uh, that's that's about all I can see for now. There's once again uh, heaps of questions coming through and, and a lot of really good ones. Uh, having trouble keeping up myself. Um, okay. Uh, well, in what we might try and do is uh, if we can't get to them all, we, we might have a few minutes at the end to go over a few more, but if we can't get to them all, we will uh, try and pull out some of the interesting topics and uh, maybe raise a few of those topics ourselves on the, the discussion forums in the coming days and see if we can you know, get a bit more discussion going on those points and, and answer them for you. So. That's another thing we can do. All right, thanks for that, James. Uh, let's go on. We've got a couple more slides to talk about uh, before I hand over to Kelsey. One of the things that I wanted to talk about is when we talk about Agile, we are, of course, talking about what has become a range of minor or sub-methodologies. And I, I call them sub-methods because Agile is more of a philosophy, a toolkit, uh, a paradigm, a way of thinking, but within that you've got a number of different methodologies that propose some somewhat quite different and somewhat sometimes similar ways of going about what they claim to be an agile method. No one of these methods is agile and others are not. They each have their own advantages and some of them have become or tried to become a little bit too specific and a bit too rigid. So some of what we talked about in the pre-recorded lectures talks about the fact that in principle, agile thinking is about using the flexibility and leveraging flexibility to good effect. It's not about saying, oh, well, we're going to use this method. We're going to use, for example, Scrum. And Scrum says that you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do something else. Well, sometimes that can be a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. It can also run contra to what we're talking about here as an agile philosophy that says well, we're going to be agile about the methodology that we're going to use. We need to think about, well, what does Scrum as a series of tools offer us? What does it offer our project? What does extreme programming offer that's going to be different? What can we pick and choose and how can we create our own methodology? Now, some of these methodologies have come about because organizations that were in sort of the pioneering stage of thinking, oh, we've got this great thing called Agile and our Agile method is called this and well, it really worked for us. We produced this great thing and we think we can make a buck out of telling everyone how we did it so that they'll do it the same way and that'll become a methodology and uh, that'll be a product for us. So that sort of thing is obviously naturally going to happen when you're talking about the commercial landscape. You're going to find methodologies that are saying that you've got to be rigid about it and it kind of is contra to the idea of agility. But having said that, a process, a system, a framework is necessary. You need to have a way in which your team can work together. So before we pick and choose what things we might want out of particular sub-methods of Agile, we've got to be fairly clear on what each of them offer and why. Where is the benefit to our project for any particular kind of methodology? But also, we've got to understand our team. And this is what we talked about tonight. We talked about the different mindsets and the different ways of tackling those mindsets. We really need to understand how our team thinks, how our team works, and how it's going to work. You're not going to have a lot of success if, for example, you've got a, a team who has a complex hierarchy and people there who are really quite possessive and defensive of their supervisory power bases that they've got with people underneath them and they feel really good about that and you come in and say well we're going to use this particular methodology that says I'm the scrum master and you all are my minions. That might not fly so well in some organizations but yet in other organizations it may be a breath of fresh air and just what everyone needs. You've got to figure these things out in enough detail to know why you're picking the path you're choosing. The two fundamental things we need to think about is how does any particular method affect the decisions that we need to make? How is it going to work with our decision-making processes? And secondly, how is it going to work with our people? Because as we're going to talk about to some extent next week, people are significantly more important in a number of different and fairly specific ways that we will cover in the Agile methodologies. So we've got to be clear on how does it affect our decisions and how does it affect our team. So when we're talking about decisions, and I know I've kind of harped on about this a little bit in the pre-recorded because 
anything to do with projects and delivery of anything over a period of time. It's all about the decisions. The decisions are what often the most important things in our lives. Everything we are and become and could be is shaped and based upon the decisions we make. And you could argue from that that nothing is more important to us in our daily lives than how we make our decisions. If we acknowledge that, or at least accept that that might be true, how we make our decisions in any project delivery has also got to be fairly important. Now, as we discussed in the, in the pre-recorded, there are two key components to decision making, content and context. Content is the facts, it's the data, it's the information that we feed into our decision making process. It's what's relevant, it's what's current. Context is the frame of reference within which that data, that content, has meaning. Now, the phrase content is king. You might have heard that before. It's something that we've borrowed, actually, uh, shamelessly, from the television industry. Now, you can understand why the television in industry would say that content is king. Content is king. What, uh, the, there is two meanings to the point of content is king. Firstly, content that we talk about within our decisions is the king of those decisions. It's the content that really matters. And it's what we feed into these decisions and we know with Agile principles, it's timely and it's relevant. So the content of the decisions we are saying, we have high respect for that content in Agile thinking because we are making sure that the content is correct, timely, relevant, appropriate and used in context. So this is why we often say context is queen. Sounds like a bit of a, uh, well, you can see where I'm heading with this analogy. So if we say that we value the currency and relevance of our content so much that we are prepared to wait for it when it's appropriate, then the context of how it's used needs to be equally current and it needs to be shared. So the chessboard analogy, content or the king is the most valuable thing we have on the board. If we lose it, we lose the game. But the queen is the most powerful tool at our disposal, and that analogy applies. The content of our decisions are the most important things we have to protect and defend, because that's what's going to help us make a great project in the end. But at the context we use, how strong it is, how well it's shared, that's the greatest tool at our disposal to use the content effectively. So content is the filter that makes, context rather, is the filter that makes content appear to be many things. Some of them good, some of them not. If our context is messed up, so will our decisions be. If part of our context is messed up because some people aren't on the same page, then you'll have great possibility for misalignment of decisions. Context is the source of our alignment. Facts are neutral. Facts are a lot less likely to have perceptional bias. Context is based on perceptional bias. And we have to often work very hard through the life of an Agile project at defending, championing, facilitating context. So context is defined as a singular principle. It's one idea, a single context. And when we have a team, and we have stakeholders, we have this multitude of perspectives. And so then our greatest challenge can be to maintain a singular context, a singular, singular way of thinking about the decisions we need to make in the face of the disparate views and opinions and different positions that people will bring to it. So as we learn more about how to empower the people, which is a, a fundamental principle of Agile, then there's one thing that people will almost never do by themselves, and that is agree. So if alignment is what we're trying to maintain, an alignment of context, alignment and agreement are not the same thing. Alignment is a shared and equivalent understanding of the situation. Agreement is a shared commitment to a course of action or a commitment to an investment. And often you need disagreement, you need the alternative. So an agile project can be enriched and can benefit from disagreement. It can benefit from the fact that in a discussion at a key decision point, you have differing views. 
you have different opinions. You have people that say, we should do this, we can do this. What about this? What about this? But as long as everyone's in the same contextual alignment, they can contribute appropriately and good, interesting and sometimes new decisions can come out of that. Sometimes opportunities can be realized and threats can be dealt with in surprising ways that we hadn't thought of and couldn't have thought of in advance. So in Agile, we often need a champion of alignment, someone whose core responsibility is to facilitate the contextual alignment within which disagreement can chart a course of resolution towards the valuable outcomes that we need. So with the context secure, the content of the decisions flow and fit neatly into their positions and good decisions come naturally from these empowered people. Only then can we say that we're working with our original and pure definition of agility and that is to act with speed and ease. Now, we're going to hand over a moment to Kelsey. Uh, just before we do that, I'm going to pause for a sec. Let's see if James got any more questions that are coming through that we can throw up and, and talk about. Uh, I've got a few here. Um, there, there was a bit more just about, um, so we, we asked about uh, budget and project duration, um, but mostly about how do you get client on side it, uh, with agile project management when they aren't assured of what the duration and the budget will be? Um, the first step I would say is think about what their perspective is. Where are they coming from? Uh, and usually they're going to be coming from a planner's perspective. And this is often to do with what I've sort of touched on before. The customer might be in an industry where plans work for them. They might be producing things that have high degree, higher degree of, of certainty. So their paradigm is about planning in advance. And they might ask us to create something that they don't necessarily inherently understand, can't be done the same way as they build their stuff. So that's one starting point. The other thing is that it's a lot to do with the education process and it's a lot to do with fear. So there's some obvious answers to the question, you say, well, what does the customer fear? The customer usually fears budget blowouts. They usually fear schedule blowouts. But if we, at least for this discussion, let's assume that those are some of the things that they fear. This is why we start with, let's putting a box around these two things. What if we put a box around our budget? What if we put a box around our schedule? And then we break our schedule down into smaller boxes and then we decide on a box by box basis, what are we going to get done? What can we get done within each box? Now, we've got to keep a greater goal in mind. We've got to keep our eye on the prize. There is a definition of an end game. We don't want to get 100% through the budget and have delivered 50% of what would be a working solution. Solution is far more than just a list of features that we happen to get done with the time allowed. So yeah, there's a certain amount of uh, need for us to say, well, you know, we have some idea of how much we can get done with our team in a certain period of time. Uh, we can't be totally ambivalent about the fact that Oh, we've got no idea how long this is going to take and you know, we've got no clue and no way of figuring it out, etc. There needs to be some stakes in the ground. This is usually based on experience. So there's some element of that. We can't turn around to a client and say, well, we don't know whether it's going to cost you 10 grand or 100 grand. Because if that's the case, we're not going to win that client over. What we need to find out is what is the key elements of certainty that they're looking for, their hot buttons, their most important criteria, and their most significant fears. And we need to work those parameters into our planning. So if we say to them, we're going to make decisions, some decisions, as we go along the way. Why are we going to do that? Because you've got concerns about budget and schedule. You want to make sure that by the day the Olympics start, that the track is ready. Pretty hard deadline, that one. So if you've got hard deadlines, we need to be flexible enough to make good decisions along the way ready decisions that can adapt and evolve what we're building to make sure that you get a good enough result within the deadline. Because if we plan everything up front and then our plan proves to be slightly imperfect, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to have to come back and say, look, we need to push the budget out, we need to push our schedule back. So if you find the fears, often you can position an agile methodology as the best way to tackle those fears.
for the question. That's great. Thanks, Brenton. What else have we got? Honestly, I, um, it's hard to pick them because I, I, uh, there are quite a lot of them. All right. I'll, we'll go one more admin style question. Just so there's a lot of questions about the exam. Um, people are asking, will there be a sample exam or any sample questions? Uh, not sample questions per se, but the study guide documents, and there'll be one for each topic, they try to prompt you on what to think about. What should you contemplate and satisfy yourself that you can that you've got your head around it and you can explain it to someone else? If you can master that, then you should do reasonably okay because that will take you down the right paths in in the study to do okay uh, in the final exam. Not obviously not a substitute from studying and learning everything, uh, but they're meant to be your guide, as it were. Uh, so there's not going to be a sample exam or trial exam uh, as there might be in the full university master's subjects, for example. Uh, there's just going to be the one, uh, the one, and it'll be multiple choice. Uh, it'll be a choice out of four. So those sorts of things we can obviously tell you and make clear in advance. So uh, some of the simplistic thing about it. So um, hopefully you'll have some indication of what to think about, but uh, not quite everything on a plate. We're going to make it hard enough to, to separate those that, uh, that try a bit harder anyway. All right, thanks for that, James. I'm going to hand over to Kelsey now. Uh, James, what we might do is uh, once we've uh, wrapped up and, and come to the conclusion of our official stage, then quite happy to uh, carry on for a little bit longer and ask a few, answer a few more questions that might still be coming through at that point. Uh, we still get lots of people on. So we can also do that. So uh, uh, just sort of uh, flag anything that you might think we should add on to the end and we'll uh, increase our discussion then. Uh, all right, I'm going to uh, hand over the presentation now to Kelsey, uh, who will give a little bit of introduction about herself and uh, share with us some of the practical challenges and things that she's come across uh, at trying to make this stuff fly. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me reasonably well, and I hope that the presentation is going to move along for me. Um, Brenton has handed it over for me. There we go. Good. Okay. Um, what gives me the right to sit here? Um, okay. I've been a software development professional in a variety of roles for probably about 15 years now. Um, and over that period of time, I would have worked on, and I was thinking about it this morning, more than 20 different software development projects. These have been web-based projects, um, desktop software, um, software in the cloud, a whole range of different um, different bits and pieces. I'm currently working in an agile project um, using the Scrum methodology, and my role in that project is what you would call, I guess, product owner. Um, although on my business card it says I'm a senior business analyst. So there you go. The interesting thing about where I'm currently working is that it's in the context of a small company which has a larger parent company which does not use agile methodologies. And that's probably one of the most interesting things um, to experience and one of the key things I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay, so software development is difficult. Not an easy task to do at all and Brenton has spoken at length tonight and in the pre-recorded lectures um, about the agile mindset which is one of the approaches which is intended to relieve some of the difficulty of software development. One of the things he's touched on are the thinking style that you need to work with agile and he's also talked about some very good reasons why you might choose to take an agile or change-driven approach to software development. As we've already said, agile is a decision-making strategy. And what it does from a practical viewpoint is it changes the when parts of the software development process rather than the what and the how. Generally speaking, you do all the same things in an Agile project as you do in a plan-driven project. You just do them at a different time and you do them at a different pace. 
what is very different is the philosophical approach and the importance of having a shared philosophical approach. And I'm going to talk about some of the practical implications of running an Agile project and how these are influenced by having, perhaps more importantly, by not having the right philosophy in place. So don't think there are too many people who would argue that software development is easy, as we've said here. There are a number of things about software that make them really hard. Brenton referred earlier to the civil engineering question, um, and those amongst other things, including the fact that software development projects are in fact empirical in their nature. Um, even if you know what you're going to build, chances are you probably haven't built anything quite like it before probably neither has anybody else. There's lots of evidence as well to say that software development's hard. When you compare the success rates of software development projects to other kinds of projects, it's not a very pretty picture. Large proportion of software development projects fail, most of them, in fact. Either totally, they get abandoned, never completed, or if they are completed, they don't meet expectations, or they develop a product that everybody hates and isn't used. That's an expensive scenario, expensive in every single sense of the word. Software that doesn't meet anybody's needs um, is costly, and that includes the needs of the people working to build the software. So Agile actually claims to offer an approach that reduces the failure rate a little bit. Um, there's some good evidence to suggest that this might, in fact, be true. The um, Standish Group in 2012 released their chaos report on Agile software development and suggested that the success rate for Agile software development projects was a whopping 42%, um, as opposed to around 30% for plan-driven projects. I don't know how many civil engineers would be happy with that um, as a general rate. And so yeah, who'd want to be a software development project manager? 42% is still not a great number, but it's better than 30%. And it's encouraging enough that quite a number of organizations now to have been willing to consider, in, consider adopting agile approaches, or at least investigating them, um, which is probably why a lot of you are here tonight. There's um, some web links in the library um, on the uh, course site as well that um, cover some of these surveys. So you can actually see that um, what these figures have been. How organizations that have decided to give Agile a go or at least have a look at it um, varies a great deal between organizations and there actually isn't a one right way. There are a few very big organizations and some that might surprise you um, such as those in highly regulated spaces like banks, um, governments, defense departments in various places that have actually adopted Agile as a wholesale for company philosophy. So those people who were earlier on asking about does Agile apply to other kinds of things as well, the answer is yes. Um, and there's a fair bit of evidence to support that. Um, some of these companies would be really familiar to um, Australians. They include Myop, so, um, which is a company that produces um, accounting software. Seek, which is a um, company that does um, web um, recruitment, advertising, um, realestate.com, um, and Ambulance Victoria, all use agile approaches to software development. And there are some international organizations um, that are entirely agile as well. These include Cisco Systems um, and Samsung Mobile. And of course, there's Google and Facebook and Twitter and all of those companies. They've adopted an agile philosophy and an approach from the sea level down. And they've got in place a full suite of governance structures to support it. So, the person before who asked the question about budgeting, not a problem for the people working there. 
What's more likely though is that an organization might have one or more teams or projects deciding to try out an agile approach. They might be just exploring what's going on. They might want to compare the results of an agile project against a traditional approach. Or it could be that they've decided to undergo a transition to agile because of the increased success rate and they're going through this process one team or one project at a time. So let's suppose that your organization has given you the go ahead to run your next project as an agile project. And let's assume that you're working in an organization like I am where a traditional or plan driven approach has been used in the past and where there's a well-defined project methodology. PRINCE2, PMP, something like that. Might even have a PMO, Project Management Office. So, there's probably an expectation that your project will begin with the development of a set of fairly traditional deliverables. These might include a project management plan. They might include a budget probably a Gantt chart. Almost certainly you'll be expected to identify some milestones, probably some deliverables to go with them, and you'll probably have to fill in a whole lot of standard templates and reports in order to get any funds released or secure any resources. If you were taking a traditional approach, you'd probably start by drawing on your own experience and your organization's experience in doing something similar in the past. You might develop the business case by working backwards from a defined set of business requirements, define a delivery date, estimate the amount of um, resources, money and skills that you're going to need to meet these. The dependent variables in this case and dependent variables are things that are allowed to change are the amount of time it's going to take to complete the project and the cost it's going to cost and the money amount of money it's going to cost. The control variable, that's the thing that shouldn't change or not in, a, in an unpredictable manner anyway, is the functionality or the what it is that you're going to build. If you're able to put all of this together in a way that makes sense from a business perspective, Probably you'll get project approval and probably initiation will follow. If you're taking an agile approach, however, you've got a problem. This is turned on its head. Budget and time become your control variables. These are fixed. They don't change or not in an unpredictable manner anyway. The functionality or what gets built within the time and budget available becomes the dependent variable. This will change according to the needs of the business and that is the key point. This problem is very likely to make the process of satisfying your PMO sufficiently even to get them to give you a project code and align in the general ledger a pretty big challenge. You're also going to have a really hard time producing the traditional Gantt chart. This isn't impossible needs to be read somewhat differently to the usual way and we'll probably talk about how you might do that later on um, in one of the later um, webinars. Your next challenge in doing this is probably going to be something you won't expect and that's going to be around departments and teams that are not actually involved in the software development process. People like sales, marketing, client relations. Most of these teams work with really long lead times and fixed dates. And while you will be able to say, yes, we will be delivering something on a particular date, you probably won't be able to give them details at this point about what that something will be or when widget A is actually going to be ready these are probably not going to be defined as much as they would ideally like. In this scenario, where an organization itself is agile, rather than just the software development process, this gives them a massive advantage because it actually 
allows marketing, sales and client support teams to have a really big input into what's actually built, far greater than they normally would. And since they're probably the experts on what's going to deliver the best value to the customer. Additionally, they can present themselves as highly responsive to customer needs. So under these circumstances, they like it a lot. But chances are you won't be working with that um, kind of scenario. Your next problem is going to be reporting, project reports. That is also going to need to change the way that you think. Especially if your software governance group measures project by reading a tracking Gantt chart and ticks off the features in a linear fashion. Agile projects do have metrics, really, really good detailed metrics, and they can show project progress at a much greater level of detail than in a traditional project. However, decisions about how you might progress through a feature list are made in a responsive fashion. They're based on what will provide the best value to the business at a given point in time. So a tracking gamut is actually not going to give you a true picture of progress at all. I'll give you an example of the kind of scenario where this might occur. An organization is developing a new pro project or a new product and suddenly they realize they want to respond to a tender. One of the tender requirements might be some functionality which you had initially thought you might do in a later release. In an agile project, the business can say, hey, we actually need to deliver X this release instead of Y because we need to demonstrate it for the tender. This is completely sensible from an agile perspective. And because we haven't planned out X or Y in great detail, and we've deferred our decision about exactly what will be delivered in this release to the latest sensible time, and that's an important key, sensible time, um, to make it, it doesn't present us with a problem. Doing this in a traditional project would be definitely a change request and you've probably got a really significant change process to go with it. In an agile project, primary measure of progress is the de demonstration of working software. Sometimes, quite surprisingly as well, this actually isn't meaningful to your governance structure. They might actually be more focused on what's not yet done rather than what is. And the key message here is that even though agile projects do um, aim to reduce organizational risk through transparency, from the perspective of your software go governance organization, especially if they're new to agile, they don't understand this. Agile looks less transparent. It looks more risky. Your next problem and again, probably a surprising one, is probably going to be the software development practitioners. Agile methodologies, both the approach and the techniques, were developed originally by software development practitioners, initially people who wrote software, and the object objective was to find a better way to develop software, implicitly a better approach to working for software development practitioners. So given this, you might be surprised when you get a really high degree of resistance amongst your technical team. This is because being agile demands commitment, accountability, transparency, openness, honesty, and above all, discipline from team members. Lots of people think that agile is undisciplined. Nothing could be further than the truth. It is more disciplined. The need for discipline comes from the requirement and the commitment to deliver working, completed, tested software very frequently. To do this, you actually have to do your job. You can't get away with delivering documents, hand-waving, or going for reviews. You've got to deliver product. And to consistently do this requires personal and professional discipline. To work on an agile project, you have to be fully involved in every aspect of the project because progress and performance are measured and against the team, not against an individual person. There's no he or she didn't do that. It's 
we didn't do that. Goals are set by the team. They're either met or not met by the team. What this means is that if you like to sit in a cubicle and have your role and your work defined for you, this is no longer possible on an agile project. And that's not a nice place to be for a surprisingly large number of people. Delivery is going to be another problem or another challenge for you. This comes across in terms of DevOps. That's the people who actually release the software. Agile projects don't release software all in one go. They release software incrementally, sometimes internally with one big release um, that goes public, but quite often releasing software to the public on a very regular couple of weeks basis. This can be a big problem if you're responsible for operational matters such as provisioning and technical support. Because if you're releasing an incremental slice of a product or a set of functionality, a whole lot of other things might be only incrementally completed at that point too. Things like technical architectures, features, technical infrastructure, supporting documentation they're developed in an agile manner as well. Um, short delivery cycles, weeks rather than months or years. So you have to have an approach that's going to work. Um, and to some extent, you have to have, or to a very large extent, you have to cooperate with those who are going to be impacted by this and actually have to deliver this stuff. Um, questions that come up are, when and how do we have to ramp up the client support teams? When do we have to order new hardware? And how can we schedule frequent releases without impacting other BAU systems? These are things that really need to be worked out um, on a continuous basis and in cooperation with the rest of the company. So if you're just sitting there developing a little agile project all by yourself, that's going to be pretty hard to do. So they're just some of the issues that you're likely to come across um, if you're taking on an Agile project or begin thinking of taking on Agile projects. We will talk a lot more about some of the practical ways that you can deal with this because they're all solvable. Um, mostly it just requires you to think about things in a different way. And to a large extent, you have to be a salesperson um, for the philosophy. I'm hoping that this discussion and some of the things that I've raised hasn't put you off um, considering Agile. It is hard. It's not harder than a traditional project. It's just different. One of the key differences that I've found as a practitioner is that I've actually got a far greater sense of control over my professional life. And due to the focus of delivering value on delivering value to the business, what I do every day is far more satisfying working in this way than it ever used to be. Um, there are some pretty good free resources around there that, around that discuss some of these issues. Um, so I might ask Brenton if we can put some of those on the course site for you. Um, a couple of YouTube videos and a number of various other um, useful things. And at this point, I'm going to hand back over to Brenton. Thanks very much, Kelsey, for that. Let me just uh, cover the, the presentation. So what we've hopefully given you tonight is a couple of things. Firstly, a bit of a high-level insight on some of the ways in which we might need to think about how we choose Agile, when we choose Agile, what is Agile. But also, uh, as we've just heard from Kelsey, some of the more less common, less obvious, practical challenges and things that we're going to need to think about uh, to embrace Agile. I want to share with you all the poll that most of you encountered uh, in the beginning. I'll see if I can pop that up on the on the screen. If you want to have a look at the uh, on your panel, uh, you should be able to see the poll uh, and the results of uh, what people put through. Most of what we have, uh, the people that are uh, responded tonight, are people that are familiar with some sort of project methodology, but not necessarily agile. So. A lot of you will be in a situation where getting stuff done is not something that you're unfamiliar with, but it's these agile ideas and how they're going to compete with, 
uh, replace or even threaten some of the ways in which you might have already gone about it uh, that are going to be possibly the most interesting. So we're trying to give it a high level feel in this particular week one as we go through this sort of stuff. Uh, now I'm going to wrap up just with a, uh, a couple of summary things for you to think about and then we will have some time for more questions and we will keep the recording going but anyone who wants to uh, hang around and uh, listen to the, qu the answers or, or put more questions up is welcome to. Continuing on with this course, do get onto the, the portal if you haven't already. Have a look in there, download the resources. Uh, you will shortly find the recording of this webinar up. These recordings are not meant to be one-off events. We would encourage you to listen to these things uh, more than once. Make your own notes. Keep record of anything that is significant for you uh, out of all this process. Uh, get into the, the forums in there. Uh, tune in and join the discussions. Create some discussions. Uh, take part in what's going on to expand your understanding. And sometimes you'll find questions in there that have been asked by others that might not have been top of mind for you, but it's still things that you're curious about. Uh, do listen to the recordings. Now, there will be next week's set of recordings will be uploaded in the next couple of days. Uh, so we'll get them to you uh, well in ahead of next week's webinar so that you've got a chance to listen to those and uh, get those into your headspace before we chat more about them and some of the peripheral issues when we meet up again next week. And of course, Join in and drop in next week. Uh, I, I understand if th there may be some of you listening to this recording because uh, the, the the webinar was full. Uh, we did bump up against our limit uh, this week, so uh, all I can suggest is uh, do make sure that you drop in, uh, join in next week. We do obviously get uh, a small amount of tapering off of attendance, so I wouldn't expect anyone to have uh, too much trouble getting on and getting involved next week. Uh, but um, but hopefully that'll all be a lot easier. Uh, now. We've got a last minute opportunity for questions. Um, thanks, Kelsey, for that input. We will get those uh, links up from Kelsey. And also, if you find links that are particularly valuable resources for you, stick them up in the forums. Put, I'll put a post in there to say, you know, put your links here. If any of them are really good, I'll, I'll move them across and put a copy of them under the, the main course site uh, so they're a little bit more prominent for people to get access to. And that list of that web library of links, that will continue to grow over the next few weeks and we'll continue to add new and interesting things so that hopefully every few days there'll be something new for, for you to look at uh, and something new to digest and get interested in. So James, can I ask, have we got any interesting questions? Firstly, about anything that Kelsey covered, was there anything that, that the people were responding to regarding of that that we can ask Kelsey to elaborate on? Yeah, yeah, we've got some really good ones. Uh, one that I believe was in relation to Kelsey, uh, it's a long one. In your position as a product owner of a project, how do you decide whether to drop or add features during an agile iterative session, especially when these changes have significant financial impact? Um, okay. Um, generally speaking, well, you don't add or drop um, features within within a within a sprint. We use scrums, so and we use two weekly sprints. So once the sprint is set. Six, we have a sprint planning process um, that generally starts with the business stakeholders um, whom I represent to the team. Um, I have an understanding of what's coming up for them, what they need, what's important, um, what have we got back from our clients about what the issues are and they will then help me prioritise from a business perspective the kinds of features that they need. The process after that then becomes one of consulting with the technical team, with the rest of the team, because they will have some priorities also. There may be a piece of technical infrastructure that's really important or a dependency, um, so we'll include those as well. Up to what we know, having now sprinted together quite a few times, we have a reasonably good idea of um, the size and complexity of each item. So I'll put up a candidate list, if you like, of functionality in priority order. And then as a team, together, all of us, QAs, BAs, developers and testers, we'll sit down, estimate that, and work out what's going to go into the next sprint. Um, and generally, that takes us um, about two hours to do. It's a, it's a time box meeting. Um, 
the how I decide or what informs my priority, which is my input, comes from both the business and the technical team. Hope that answers the question. That's great. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, we've got some more questions here. Uh, I guess either of you could um, jump in to answer any of these. What are the main causes of agile project failure? Uh, why don't you go first, Kelsey? We'll, we'll, we've both probably got an answer to this one. Well, I can make a contribution um, to this. Okay. Oh, sorry, you want me to go first? Yes, uh, please. Uh, absolutely, Kelsey. Okay, sorry. Um, I could make a contribution to this because it's something that I've actually um, just done some um, research on. And funnily enough, the main cause of project failure is lack of corporate support for the philosophy, for the process. It's as simple as that. That's the primary cause of failure. If you do not have organizational and management support, you have almost no chance of success. That's mm. simple. So this ties back to a lot of what we were talking about. Uh, Over to you, Brendan. <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great to hear that from the practical experience of having pushed up against that wall because what we tried to talk about tonight is some of the core reasons why people don't give their support. And it's a lot to do with their uncertainty of what Agile really is and what it isn't. And if we are involved in Agile or might be or we might be proponents of Agile in an organization when we see that that corporate support might be a challenge there are certain things that we need to think about in order to try and maximize that support look ahead and see where those challenges might come from what are the mindsets of the people involved what are their fears what's their attitudes and how do we need to go about convincing them that we can deliver a great project using these kinds of methodologies or a variation thereof so I think it's a lot about dispelling the myths. It's a lot about the educational process. And as, as Kelsey said, it's often an uphill battle because we're often dealing with decision makers whose core functionality involves planning for certainties and planning with certainties. And we're asking them to put faith in something that says, no, let's delay the certainty and let's look at some other priorities. So this can often be a challenge for people who have executive positions who especially have financial responsibilities for an organization, uh, who have future and vision responsibilities, revenue responsibilities, etc. These things can be challenging for them to get their head around, let alone accept. Great. Uh, would you like another question? Yes, uh, certainly. We've, we, we can uh, spend another five to ten minutes, go through a few more questions before we wrap up the recording tonight. All right, we've we've had a, a few questions come in, come in along the lines of, is Agile focused more towards software development than other projects? I think it was originally developed and uh, is more common and more popular in that sort of thing. It ties back to the empirical nature of the project, and we kind of know that software development is highly empirical uh, for for many reasons that we talked about. If you look at that list of empirical project challenges. If you've got some other project that's not related to software development and yet you can see a lot of those challenges being relevant for you, then maybe there's a certain need for agility with whatever your project is trying to deliver. So that's the real test. It's the empirical nature and can you really safely make all your decisions up front? Should you make your decisions up front? Are they going to be much better off if you rearrange your decision making? And if you want to do that, how and in what way should you try and embrace agility? It's not just about saying, let's throw waterfall out the door and let's go totally agile and make everyone a little bit scared along the way. It's about how do we bring agility into what we're doing to meet the needs of our decision making and it works with our team. So we're kind of saying you can pick and choose from a lot of different things, but ultimately you've got to be really clear about what you're answerable to. You're answerable to your decisions, you're answerable to your team. Kelsey, did you have any additional thoughts on that?
Yeah, no, no, probably not much more to add. I think I think you. I agree with you. I think that um, agile as an approach is, yeah, it depends on the project. It is mostly found in software, but as an approach, you could use it to develop to deliver any kind of project. I've actually seen it used in developing uh, creative projects, television shows, uh, on set and production. I've seen elements of agility used in that because you've got. Yes, you have a, a script, but you also have the possibility of evolving and improving that script as the story unfolds. And you know, we've all heard the stories about uh, the movie that got rewritten halfway through. Well, there's a certain sense of saying if you've got anything that, that uh, is creative in its nature rather than constructive in its nature, then maybe there's a case for having agility involved. Uh, what other questions have we got, James? Uh, a bunch more. We'll grab um, the ones that seem the most popular. Yeah. All right. Are there any software tools that help with using agile methodologies in projects? Um, my first thought on the software tools, and, and I will uh, I will ask Kelsey also to comment on this. But my first thought with software tools goes back to what we touched on a little bit in uh, in the strictly agile slide is that. Be wary of tools that lock you in to a potentially narrow interpretation of agile thinking. So firstly, you're going to find tools that are there to try and uh, take some of the other choices away from you, but also there to try and uh, make some of the replication of, of processes simpler, to make some of the sharing of things simpler. So there's some things that the tools are going to be really good for depending on the nature of your team and the way in which you need to share and manage data and information and, and activity. But there's also potentially some tools out there that might push you down a particular path that you might feel or, or might turn out to be not necessarily the best version of it, agile thinking that, that you want to embrace. So there are some traps in that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of debate going on about uh, how agile is agile in the terms, in the sense of are these sort of sub methods becoming too rigid and too limited. So yes, there are tools. These tools are obviously evolving. We're talking about something that's really only a few years old in maturity. And I guess we're talking about software tools that had to be made using some sort of probably agile methodology. So they're kind of inventing things as we go to some extent. I, I think we've got a long way to go before we see some really good mature and flexible to, uh, options out there. Uh, Kelsey, you might know of some that, that are actually uh, already quite mature. Do you, do you have any that you've encountered already? Um, we're, we actually use um, Atlassian tools, so um, JIRA uh, with the Greenhopper, um, Agile, um, Agile Add-in and uh, Confluence for our documentation. The reason, and, and yes, Atlassian are extremely agile. We get updates and new functionality fairly regularly every couple of weeks and it's based on what the users of the software have indicated to Atlassian they actually need. The reason we use that particular tool is that it is incredibly flexible. You can use it to support whatever adaptation of Agile because um, Agile is in reality an adaptation of an approach. Um, so you can use it in whatever way that, it, that suits you. Um, so that, that's been my experience. There are a lot of other um, really good tools out there, but um, those, those are the ones that I've worked with, um, worked with most. We might put a forum post up there. Um, so Kelsey, thanks for that thought. We, we might put a forum post up about tools uh, and uh, ask Kelsey to put some thoughts in there and also let anyone else who's encountered some tools that they found useful and why that they might want to uh, put up there and talk about why they found that particular tool useful. So to share that knowledge amongst the group. Uh, all right, uh, James, we've got time for maybe another two questions. Uh, if we can, uh, if you've got two particular that jump out at you. Uh, how do you secure a specialty resource for a spring if the plan is made so close to the sprint? I'm going to pass that question to Kelsey. <laughs> okay. Um, well, for a start, we don't have specialty resources. We have a cross-functional team. Um, it doesn't have specialists um, in it. So we don't. 
is the answer. So how would you if you had to though? Can, can you theorize for us what, what might work? I'm just trying to think of an example where you... Is there any indication of what kind of specialty resource we might be thinking about here? I guess if you're thinking about a relatively small team, you might have a specialist who has a particular knowledge of a particular a code or, or a particular uh, aspect of what needs to be done. And if you've got bottlenecks in your resource list, then those bottlenecks might become, or those, those limited resources might become more of a driving force in the planning meeting. It doesn't mean that you don't have the planning meeting in all the same way. It doesn't mean you don't have your sprint plan meetings that say, okay, so this is what we're going to do in the next sprint, or this is what we're going to do next, and this is how we're going to evolve our decisions. But there might need to be, obviously, a, a work in place that says, well, we've got this limited resource, and this person is the one person that knows all this end of it, and they're only one person. They can only work on this thing at a time. So there can be some uh, leaning, if you like, that says, well, we, we're going to be somewhat dependent upon the decisions of portions of the resources, and from that, the decisions of what other people are going to be doing might be a little bit easier because they're going to be somewhat dependent upon it. And that, that situation does occur, and that's very true, and you will have a situation where you've got an individual who, in fact, is, is a constraint for you. Um, so when you have that scenario, then, then really you work to protect your constraint um, and to make sure that that person is freed up to do what they need to do. But in terms of people coming on and off um, scrum teams or people working on multiple projects, it just doesn't work that way. So that, that, that second scenario doesn't, doesn't occur. Um, but yeah, you do have a scenario sometimes where one person is the best person at a particular skill set. Um, yeah, and you, you have to manage that. Yeah, I, I agree with what Kelty's saying too. Is you have to protect that, that sort of resource because that person will usually know the level of uh, importance they have and the pressure that this can, this can bring. And we can often find ourselves in an even worse situation if we're not sufficiently protecting that resource from the unnecessary stress and we find that that resource implodes and they're not, ev not even available. Uh, then, you know, obviously things can get uh, pretty dire uh, when that sort of situation happens. So we look after the golden eggs a little bit more perhaps because we need to. They're a higher risk point for us in these sort of projects. Uh, yeah, I agree very much with that. And sometimes that can inform your planning as well. Yes, yeah, definitely, I agree with that. Uh, all right, James, let's have our last question for tonight because we do need to draw a line under our uh, webinar this evening. Uh, yep, all right, last question. Does Agile work well with geographically dispersed teams? Um, my initial thought, uh, I'll jump in first with this, my initial thinking is that Agile can actually work in a superior fashion with geographically dispersed teams. And one of the reasons I say that, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. We've talked a little bit already about the fact that you need a strong context, you need a strong alignment. And you could say that keeping that alignment strong can be a little bit tougher when people are more spread out and different time zones and things like that. And yes, it can be tougher. But on the flip side, with an agile methodology and with the shared awareness that the protection and preservation of this shared understanding and context is so important, you often find that the people themselves, they make that little extra bit of effort that's necessary to connect with each other in ways that they might not have otherwise done in a more traditional project approach. So you've got this paradigm that says, to do it this way, we need to have a certain approach to our intellectual connectedness, even though our geographical connectedness has challenges. And therefore, we're going to require this sort of effort, this sort of effort, this sort of activity, and these sorts of things. So in my experience, whilst it's harder to achieve in some ways, when it's working, it is often working far more effectively than you can find or often find in traditional approaches. Does that at all reflect on anything you've seen, Kelsey? How's it working for you? Um, I really, I mean, I, in that sense, I, I can't add more to what you said other than to say that I agree with you completely. Um, I'm, my current situation is that we're not 
a geographically dispersed team. In fact, we all sit very close together indeed, as we should. Um, but I've worked alongside projects that have had geographically dispersed teams, um, and I've seen that work. Um, and there are also a lot of other people um, running projects with the um, professional community who work in that way. So I would just strongly agree with what you've said. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, folks. Thanks for all those awesome questions. Uh, there's lots of great interest and involvement in the discussion. And as we said originally, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to cover all of the questions that, that come up. But we will do our best to try and maybe pick a couple of them out uh, that looked a bit uh, relevant and put some thoughts up in the discussion forums and, and trigger a few conversations. But by all means, uh, get online there. Put your thoughts and comments and questions up. We will get these recordings up as quickly as we can uh, over the next uh, 24 hours, make them available as quick as we can. But uh, until then, we're going to sign off in a few moments. Thanks very much for tuning in. We've had a terrific turnout tonight. We look forward to not only chatting with you on the forums, uh, but we also look forward to having you tune in next week at the same time for our discussion on Agile principles. Thanks very much to James and Alex. Thanks very much to, uh, to Kelsey for all your input. And thanks, everyone, for coming along for tonight. Until next week, thank you and good night. Thanks, Brenton.